would not allow you to um, converse. You were given a script and this is what you stuck to. And from time to time I would rebel and say this is, this is uh, uh, facile or whatever else. And they'd look at me and say, oh, what do you know? And then eventually they said, no, you can't do it. You're not a warm personality. But would you like to have a go at news reading? Because they were using in Dunedin actors to read the news. And the actors were falling apart for want of direction. They were sitting there sweating, making mistakes, because they didn't really know what a newsreader should be. And I think well, I had some sort of instinct for it. And uh, once I'd done it, I, rather, I really enjoyed it. It seemed to be reasonably substantial. Not incredibly demanding, but at least you can sit up straight, look at the camera, and tell what, you know, list the world's offences. The moment I, f I read my first news bulletin on DNTV2, I had a feeling that I could do this, and I knew somehow how it should be done. Does that sound pompous? No. You just knew. I was a much better newsreader than I was a continuity person. I was more comfortable. The stuff was in front of you. But all it required was a good pre-read and an ear for emphasis and, yep, just really, it was quite fun, although, of course, a lot of them, in those days, they saw the top of your head a lot, <laughs> which uh, you, you, know, you made sure that everything was nice and tidy up there. There was a very, very good training facility. Some people find it, found it quite discouraging. But um, there was a constant flow of memos back and forth. Somebody was always listening. Somebody was always there to correct your pronunciation, or as today's would have it, pronunciation. And <laughs> there was, um, God help you. You needed to constantly be aware that someone was listening and criticizing. And it was extremely fortunate, I think, that we had remarkably good directors and very good uh, journos and that made reading the news a lot easier. There were never any traps, no grammatical problems, nothing. You could in fact be handed a piece of paper and after we read from paper in those days, we were reading the news, well, there was no auto cue. Um, you could be handed a piece of paper and you'd know that it contained no sentences that were going to trip you up, nothing. So you had real confidence in these people, and I did, and you had a terrific feeling of teamwork involved here. Very often, you try to establish a link with a certain place, and it falls apart. So what do you do then? Well, we used to, I used to lift this telephone and talk to the control room, supposedly, while the control room talked back to me. The director was telling me what was going on and what to expect. But of course, he wasn't talking to me at all. For the most part, he was trying to sort things out. But you sort of, yes, oh yes, oh yes, so there's a little bit of acting going on there, a little bit. Sometimes the telephone rang more than once a night, once I think it rang five times. And then I got a little bit black. Oh, I, you know, I, I think I said, well, I said to the camera something like, you know, well, you can, play, you can see plainly we're in technical trouble. And I'm sick of apologizing for it. <laughs> and the uh, two I see to the Director General, an Australian gentleman, this, is, and that, this will be 1975, so it was quite late in the day for me, took me aside the next day and said, never, ever do that again. You don't apologize in that way. But the phones went hot and people said, well, he was being real. So uh, later on they apologized to me, they said, okay. I mean, you cannot obfuscate and, and muck around forever. You've got to tell the truth. I was put in a difficult position. I was asked to go to Auckland, but not many people from Television One were. And all of a sudden, the team was disbanded, and I was asked to perform for people I didn't know, with people I didn't know, and I felt very uncomfortable at that prospect. And I felt also that there was an element of treachery, and that I was turning you know, bye bye chaps, have a great time, I'm off to Auckland. I couldn't do it, besides which my family, my wife didn't want to move. And anyway, I couldn't see, you could not see the reason. I mean, television One had been so successful. And I'd spent all those years, as most people do, you think success breeds success. And alas, it did not.
Well, it was Bill Earl's idea. He had a, a producer and a team, and he also approached another presenter, Isla McLeod, Isla Benge, and um, knowing that she was a very good writer and a very, very good presenter. Uh, and between the two of us, we would present this motoring program, and they approached Chris Amon as a someone with, um, with considerable mana associated with, with uh, cars, and also a very, uh, um, a moderate, not terribly flamboyant or anything like that, but a man whose opinion was considered. And, uh, and we had a great time filming, rushing around filming cars. And things were fairly primitive, you know. They don't have, they don't have the, uh, the technical facilities they have today. We certainly didn't have helicopter shots and we didn't drop cars from great heights. So we were supposed to give the cars back and at least as good and slightly more miles, you know, a few more miles on the clock, but um, the cars should go back in as good a condition as we received them. From time to time we did actually have to patch them up, I have to say. You had a, a panel and on the panel were such luminaries as uh, Marshall Seifert, Cherry Raymond and Trevor Plumley, very different people. And I was a little bit in awe of them initially, and a, a wee bit apprehensive when it came to Marshall. You have to say to yourself, oh, "What the hell is he going to say next?" Because, because he would feel instinctively a lull in the pro. He, well, what he thought to be a lull in the program, <laughs> and he was like, "Right, what do I do here?" And he'd say something totally outrageous and vain. But it was cheap. There was no, the budget was dreadful, really. I mean, and, and I didn't get, I got very little money for that program, and it took us everywhere. It was an odd feeling. I really wanted to do it. I mean, it was a film, for God's sake, you in a film. Uh, and then I thought, how do we do this? Because my, the newsreader and re, re actually rebelled. Would I, if a situation such as Stead had written, had, you know, if this was a situation we were in in this country politically, how would a newsreader respond? Would I have said some time previously that this is, we are going, we've gone too far, this is no longer a democracy, this is whatever, an autocratic state, whatever. Uh, would I have done that? Would I have been sufficiently principled? To, uh, so all these little thoughts were mixing around, well all I need to do is just sit there and read the damn thing, that's all really. So I tried to give this performance as someone slightly distracted by it, slightly worried by not what he was saying necessarily, but by his very presence, by being required to say this. And um, I'm not sure if it came off, but it didn't matter, it was there. I was Uncle Jonathan in one of those twists of the tail. Some of them are pretty ratty, but this was, I quite, like, I, I was a ghost that came through, I lived in the house, came through. Who was the, who was the, the villain? Uh, Ray Wolf, was it? Yeah, yeah. And I was to, with came through the wall with a sword. I worked hard on that, and I have actually, I'm quite proud of it in its own way. I actually think it works quite well. It's very, just a tiny little piece. You know. I'm not sure whether William Shatner has even looked at it, but he was the, he told the tales. He gathered people around and little, you know, the kids around at the beginning of each of those. I don't think it's a career highlight, actually, Andrew, but I enjoy, did enjoy doing it. That's a, a, a fascinating and very disciplined experience. With our, I mean, the film experience was quite different. You'd think you'd get plenty of direction, I got none. But when you're actually narrating a program, you get an incredibly careful, almost cloying um, direction. Because in, this, in the um, control room, there's, there's the director, this is their baby. And every word is precious. Every word has a particular inflection, a particular meaning. Sometimes you think, oh yeah, really? It's not very poetic, is it? But, and all those scripts used to go through, uh, well, an extraordinary process of editing. Sometimes it, it felt to me that I'm reading something from which the life has been extracted. You've actually kicked You've kicked the vitality out of this sentence. But no, you don't say things like that, you just get on with it. It's, <laughs> some have been great. And uh, I mean, the f uh, always filmically, visually stunning, some of this stuff. 
I think it's been a muddle. I've never, apart from news reading, I don't think I've gone as far as I should. Well, this is nothing, that's, it's, it's not personal pride speaking. What it's speaking, I think, is I'm disappointed in myself. There were certain times when I let myself down. I let the side down in a couple of, pro couple of programs that I presented because my nerves get in the road. I think it would have been nice to be a more expensive personality. I mean, I'm genuine about that. I think that, um, for, I mean, in, in the quiet of my own home, I tend to do a lot of singing. And the, the occasional dramatic role if in local theatre has been difficult, but hugely rewarding. And I think that that's essential. I mean, I'm not, I'm not yet prepared to retire. I still think there's, that there's something to offer. And, and you still, I still get a hell of a kick out of it.